All right, welcome back for more proteomics. So this next video is not going to be a terribly long one, but it's going to be an important discussion for us to have about the evolutionary relationships that different proteins have with each other and how proteins within an organism can actually change over time. So let's start by defining evolution. So what evolution is, is it's just a phenomenon by which a species of organism adapts to changes in their environment over time. Okay, so what is the nature of those adaptations? Well, I wouldn't be bringing it up if proteins were not involved. So these adaptations or changes are manifested by mutations or changes to the DNA code that are therefore going to change the instructions on how to make specific proteins. So I think an analogy that I invoked in the first video is that a gene, a, D, a piece of DNA, a gene, is like a blueprint for building a house. So that blueprint is going to tell you how big is the house, uh, what materials is it going to be built out of, what kind of insulation do, is it going to have, what kind of floors is it going to have. So the blueprint is just full of information, right? It's not the house itself, it's just information. The same way the gene is just information on how to build a protein that eventually the ribosome is going to read in the form of messenger RNA and it's going to actually stick the amino acids together. Well, you can actually change the blueprints. You can make alterations to what is in the blueprints. If the blueprints say to build this house out of brick, you can cross out the word brick and you can write wood or you can write adobe or you can write stucco or whatever you want to build the house out of. So if the builder opens the blueprints and they see the new instructions, then they're going to build the house that way. The same thing applies to genes. If we change the DNA sequence, that's going to change how the ribosome interprets those instructions and puts the protein together. So if we get mutations in our DNA over time, that's going to change the amino acid makeup of our proteins and it can impact things like how the protein functions, how the protein folds, and things like that. So the idea here, just to summarize, is that if you alter the nucleotide sequence in a gene, you are going to potentially change the order of amino acids in the protein, and therefore, for better or for worse, you're going to change that protein's function over time. Now, mutation is the kind of word that gets a really negative connotation associated with it. There are good mutations, there are bad mutations. You hear a lot more about the bad mutations than you do the good. And then there are neutral mutations. There are mutations that really don't produce any sort of effect at all. So evolution is characterized by the accumulation of good mutations in organisms that are adapting to their environment. The idea being those good mutations and those changes to the protein function are what now allow them to survive in their new environment, live long enough to reproduce, and those good genes and good mutations are going to continue to be passed on from generation to generation. And then those organisms which do not adapt, do not get those good mutations, or rather get bad mutations, they are going to die an early death, and they are going to die off before they have the chance to reproduce and pass on their heritable traits to their offspring. So that should be a pretty good review of evolutionary biology, which hopefully you remember some of from your general biology classes. The idea, though, is that these changes generally take quite a long time to occur and then develop over many generations of that species. So this is not the sort of thing that's just going to happen tomorrow, right? So usually this is going to take at least hundreds, if not thousands of years. But sometimes, if you're looking at the history of the evolution of a particular species, a very critical mutation may actually cause a species to branch off into their own species. And this is congruent with the idea that all the species on Earth are derived from a common ancestor. A common ancestor that mutated over time and started producing different species that were different enough because they had proteins that had drastically different functions. So let's talk a little bit about point mutations. So these are the most simple type of mutations. They are characterized by the change in a single nucleotide within a gene. 
Now, these are not the only types of mutations. You can have much more large-scale mutations like gene duplications, which we talked about, I think, in the second or third video. Uh, you can have whole gene deletions where you just take a huge stretch of DNA and you just basically cut it out. So we're going to focus on these point mutations here, which are just single changes to single nucleotides. So these point mutations, as you can see here, we're focusing on the DNA level, looking at three nucleotides at a time because that's a codon, the mRNA level, and then finally the protein level. So don't forget that a codon tells you which amino acid is going to be incorporated into the protein. So if you look here on the far left, this is, let's say, this is what we would call the wild type form of the protein. So this is what it's supposed to be. This is what you find in the majority of proteins in a given species. So let's say that this codon is supposed to be thymine, thymine, cytosine. So at the mRNA level, complementary to that, we are going to get adenine, adenine, guanine. Well, if you look at your genetic code, the ribosome is going to look at adenine, 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 guanine and say, okay, that codes for a lysine. So what we're saying is that for this particular protein, whatever it is that we happen to be looking at here, this particular codon is supposed to code for the amino acid lysine. And let's just assume that that lysine is critical to the protein's function. Okay, so using that as our example, as our jumping off point, let's take a look at different types of point mutations and what kinds of effects those could have. The first and most benign type of mutation is called a silent mutation. This is going to change the DNA sequence. So you see we change that cytosine to a thymine. So instead of TTC, we get TTT and then AAA. So this changes the DNA sequence and the mRNA sequence, but it is not going to change the amino acid sequence. You'll recall that there are 64 different combinations of codons, 61 of which code for amino acids. So 61 codons code for 20 amino acids. That means there has to be redundancies, and lysine is one of those amino acids that has redundancies. T, T, or excuse me, AAG and AAA are both codons that code for the amino acid lysine. So the reason I said this is a benign mutation is because this is not going to produce any sort of change in the protein itself because we still incorporate the amino acid lysine. So this is basically no harm, no foul. Silent mutations do not change the protein and therefore they produce no real biological effect. The next and arguably the most horrible kind of point mutation is called a nonsense mutation. This involves changing a nucleotide such that we produce a early or premature stop codon. So in this case, we were supposed to have lysine, but because we go from TTC to ATC, which at the mRNA level, complementary to ATC, we get UAG, Guess what? That's a stop codon. So instead of the ribosome continuing to read through the mRNA and continuing to add not only this lysine residue, but all the other amino acids that come after that, the ribosome is going to see that stop codon and say to itself, okay, I'm not supposed to add any more amino acids, so this protein as we have it right now, that's the finished product. So a nonsense mutation is going to cause a protein to end up being a lot, much too short. It's going to contain far too few amino acids compared to what it's supposed to be. A good example of a disease that is ca uh, caused by one of these nonsense mutations is something that I'm sure you've heard of before, cystic fibrosis. This is caused by a nonsense mutation in the CFTR gene. It causes the CFTR transport protein that is found in the digestive tract and the respiratory tract to not be made properly so that it cannot do its job. And as far as respiratory function goes, people with cystic fibrosis end up with a really hard kind of mucousy material accumulating in their lungs and it makes it very hard to breathe. 
And then finally, the last of the types of point mutations is called a missense mutation. This is the type of nucleotide change that changes the actual amino acid sequence of the protein, but does not produce an early stop codon. So in this case, we provide two different examples of missense mutations, both of which we fail to insert the amino acid lysine, which is what we're supposed to do, but one of these is actually better, or rather better for the organism than the other. The first is called a conservative missense mutation. So instead of uh, inserting the amino acid lysine, which is one of the basic amino acids, we instead insert the amino acid arginine. Now, this is not the correct amino acid, but there is hope that the protein should still be pretty functional because even though this is not lysine, it is still a basic amino acid. So there is hope that arginine should be able to fill in for lysine fairly well because they are both basic amino acids. But a non-conservative mutation would be one in which the amino acid lysine, which is basic, is pr uh, replaced with an amino acid that is totally not in the same category. In this case, we insert the amino acid threonine, which is polar, but is, it is not basic. So it is unlikely to fill in for lysine in any significant way. A good example of a disease which is caused by a non-conservative missense mutation is the disease sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia, in which case the amino acid aspartate is replaced with the hydrophobic amino acid valine. So that's about as non-conservative as it gets, and it causes the beta globin uh, protein to not fold correctly, and it causes red blood cells to take on that characteristic sickle shape. Okay, so now that we have a pretty good handle on how proteins can change over time as they accumulate different types of mutations, let's talk a little bit more about evolution of proteins over time in different species. So in this case, we are going to continue to work with the hemoglobin example that we talked about in the previous video. It turns out that most organisms do express some kind of oxygen binding protein. For us as humans and other mammals, we've got two of those. We've got hemoglobin and we've got myoglobin. Hemoglobin found in our red blood cells, myoglobin found in our slow twitch muscle fibers. But most organisms, even if it's not hemoglobin or myoglobin, most organisms, even if it's bacteria, they do express some kind of oxygen binding protein, a protein that can complex with uh, molecular oxygen. So if you look at this phylogenetic tree that you're looking at here, the way you read this is the top of the tree is the most recent. So this is basically present day time. And then as you go towards the bottom of the tree, this is literally thousands, if not millions of years ago that we're looking at here. So you can see hemoglobin here in vertebrates. We've got alpha globin and beta globin, which as we said in the prior video, conglomerate together in quaternary form to form hemoglobin. Myoglobin is a monomeric protein that is found in our muscles. And then as you go down through the phylogenetic tree, you can see we've got kind of similar proteins that are found in insects and annelids and nematode flatworms. And then if you look kind of further over to the right where we see a lot more evolutionary divergence, you can see legohemoglobins, -hemo which are uh, which are proteins that serve the same sort of function, but there is enough of an amino acid difference between leg hemoglobin and hemoglobin itself to indicate that, okay, they're not really that closely related. So these are the types of hemoglobins that you're going to find in uh, things like plants. But if you follow both of these branches of the tree further down, you can see that we have uh, algae and protozoan ancestors, fungal uh, oxygen binding protein ancestors, if you follow the phylogenetic tree all the way to the bottom down, you can see evidence that all these different types of oxygen binding proteins, the ones that you find in vertebrates, invertebrates, plants, uh, single cell eukaryotes, bacteria, fungi, they all seem to have a common ancestor. There was originally this one gene in some ancestral organism that we all share in common, this one gene that produces this protein that can bind to oxygen. As this gene over time accumulates all these different mutations, 
different species do different things with these mutations and this protein, and they kind of go off and do their different thing. And even then, those genes continue to accumulate mutations until you end up with these branches that you see here in which uh, these proteins, which we have evidence that these proteins all used to be the same thing, now there is a big enough difference in their primary amino acid sequence that they don't really resemble that them, uh, each other all that much anymore. But this is really just to emphasize again the point that the change in a protein over time is the result of the accumulation of mutations. So what we can conclude here is whatever mutations that say vertebrates got in their oxygen binding protein, those must have been good mutations that suit us and allow us to survive in whatever particular environment we like to live in. Whereas leg hemoglobin for plants, the mutations that that hemoglobin accumulated over time. It might not be good for us humans or for other mammals or vertebrates, but it maybe it's good for plants and uh, trees and things like that. It's perfect for the environment that they live in. So really to wrap up this evolution discussion, you can say that evolution as it pertains to the change in amino acid sequence over time, it's all about changing the function of the protein to suit changes in your environment. It's all about producing advantageous cellular and physiological effects that allow an organism to survive better and live longer so that they can reproduce and pass those beneficial mutations on to the next generation. So if you look at this diagram here, you can actually see not only hemoglobin, uh, the beta subunit that actually makes up part of hemoglobin, myoglobin, which we said is a monomeric protein that is found in our muscles, and then leg hemoglobin, which is found in plants. These proteins have significant differences in their primary structure, in their amino acid sequence, but you'll notice that if you look at the folded shape of them, they still look pretty similar. So. The question here is, what do you think is really more important for a protein's function? Is it the very specific sequence of amino acids, or is it, the, is it its shape? Is it its secondary structures and its tertiary structures? So the fact that after millions of years of evolution that the amino acid sequences, the primary structures are so different, but even after all that, they still tend to fold in the same way, I think the answer is pretty obvious. It's more about the shape of the protein that gives it its function more so than the nitty gritty specifics of which amino acid goes where. And then finally, once again, if we look at hemoglobin here, Another type of mutation that we can talk about, and I mentioned this earlier, so we'll go ahead and talk about it again. Another type of mutation is called gene duplication, basically making a copy of a whole gene so that instead of having one gene, you've got two genes. The idea here, functionally as it pertains to hemoglobin, is that if one of those two copies starts accumulating mutations and the other one does not, eventually the gene that mutates is going to end up being so different from the other copy that you could literally just consider it a whole new gene. So this, evolutionarily speaking, is how we ended up with an alpha globin gene and a beta globin gene. The idea is that since our ancestral oxygen binding gene was just one gene itself, at some point we must have duplicated that gene, changed one of them so that we have two different types of oxygen binding proteins that are going to work together to form hemoglobin. All right, so that is going to do it for our discussion on evolution. There are going to be times throughout the semester, we're not gonna de dedicate a whole section to it like we did just here, but there will be times where we need to kind of bring up these sorts of uh, discussions and concepts again. So don't expect this is gonna be the last you've heard of this. So evolutionary relationships between protein is something that's always going to be important for us. Okay, that is going to do it for this video. Join us for one last video in this particular lecture when we start gently introducing different classes of proteins and what proteins generally kind of accomplish, right? So we've talked all about how to build proteins, what proteins are made of, how they fold, but what do proteins do? So we're gonna get a general idea of that in the next video.
Thanks again for your attention, and I will see you next time. So long.